day, great week, and we're going to be talking again about uh, some storytelling principles. And I figured, what if we chat today about storytelling and movie genres? Uh, this was an idea that came from our, our boy Wahab at Storyboard Art, and I think it's a good idea to talk about these things because they come up so often when we are talking story and developing our idea, our our ideas, and we have to keep in mind what kind of genre of film we're working on and also what the target is for our storytelling. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about that. Uh, as always, it's a good idea to come with your questions, connect, uh, talk to other people who are on this chat. You can see us on Facebook and Instagram, and you can catch our replay. We post that on YouTube. So uh, there's, there's been a really good conversations, actually, uh, not just about technical stuff, but also about career stuff. And I always find that talk really useful because, uh, especially when I was starting out, nobody was talking about that stuff, and I had to like figure it out. Like, who do I ask? What do I do? And I didn't know anybody in the industry that would kind of give me that insider information. So I kind of had to ask close friends, maybe some teachers, and people like that who would help me out. And that that was great. But then until I actually started making friends in the industry. I would ask them, hey, you know, how much are you getting paid? <laughs> and, you know, cl close friends, obviously. And, you know, what do I do with this resume? How, you know, this, this job thing came up. You know, what do you think? How should I apply? Right? And that kind of stuff was, uh, was always really hard to come by. And so that, I, I really, because of that, I openly talk about rates and I openly talk about career stuff and resumes and interviews and all that junk. Because, you, I mean, where else can you find it? Especially when we're talking about storytelling, visual arts, narrative filmmaking. Like, who's talking about that specific thing? Well, we are, damn it. <laughs> and, and then so when it comes to genre and we're talking about storytelling, like, how many times do you hear this discussion come up? And it's really not, not that often. So, um, so let, me, let, me, uh, let me get into it a little bit now. Uh, let me arrange my windows here on my, my computer so I can see who's who's joining up here. Hey, Chad, what's happening? Good to see you, buddy. Um, so, yeah, it's like, okay, hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about when I say genres because there are uh, – it's not just like, um, you know, action movie and drama and comedy. There's – you know, that's part of it, but there's more, there's more to it than that, like uh, – and it, it gets in depth with it. Um, I busted out my, my Save the Cat book. I'll, I'll show you that in a second because um, th that one I think has a really good discussion about genre and, and talking about uh, like different categories where you can specialize in particular uh, filmmaking tropes and then also figure out a way to, to make it unique to what whatever project you're doing. Okay. So uh, okay, let's 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 talk let's talk a little bit. About it. Hopefully, you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay. The major categories would be obviously in narrative film and that kind of stuff. You're talking about a drama, and you can get your, your comedy. And I always say, like you've heard me repeat over and over again, like in your portfolio, you want to show examples of comedy scenes, of dramatic scenes, uh, maybe some action scenes. So these are the general categories of of uh, let's say visual storytelling that we can do at the moment. Now let's get into that. So within action, you can have an action in a horror movie, you can have an action in a drama movie, you can have an action in comedy, right? So action is not necessarily the most specific thing for that. Um, it is better to like look and, and get into it. And that's why I got my, my handy dandy, my cheat sheet here. This is the book that I've referenced for you guys a bunch of times. So Save the Cat I find is really good um, when it comes to talking about genre. Hey, all right. It's uh, we got some some great peeps up here on the, on Instagram. What's up, Mike? How are you? Uh, and also on Facebook too. So that that's good that everybody's uh, joining up right now. So uh, and if you have your questions, bring them into the chat, and we'll we'll see if we can field those. But getting back to this one, this particular book was surprising when I first read it because uh, it's a screenwriting book, right? If you guys don't know this, I'd recommend this a couple times. It's a really quick read. I mean, look how thin this is. There's only about 200 pages, and uh, and it goes over uh, in some in some really juicy detail that I really like the um, a, a, a kind of a unique breakdown of genres. So uh, they have things like you know instead of horror movie they have monster in the house, and there's the the buddy love story right instead of just like a romantic comedy. 
And he breaks it down too. Like I just opened this up. There's, um, let me see if I can find some of his tropes that, that, yeah. Okay. So who done it, a fool's triumph, um, you know, who done it would be like a mystery movie where you're trying to solve it. And that could also encompass many different films in many different, what we would consider like the normal categories of movies. Right. So, um, like for monster in the house, since I'm working on kind of that genre of film right now, uh, with this alien movie that I'm working on, we got an alien, right? So uh, the film, the Ridley Scott's original Alien movie is a monster in the house film, according to Blake Schneider, and that kind of category, that genre. It's all, So Jaws is also that same monster in the house category. So you can see that there, um, the similarities, obviously there's like a, there's a monster, right? So there's a shark in Jaws movie and there's a big alien in the Alien movie. Um, you can also have a human monster, which would be like, um, uh, let's see, Basic Instinct, I think, was was one of those that was also in that category. So what that means by so Basic Instinct, there's like a, a mo human monster character, right, essentially is a human being, but would be considered like a bad, evil person. And that's the monster. And you're trapped with that person. You, and you have to essentially, there's rules to the game, the rules to that genre. So uh, that's what I think is, is kind of cool. So what what we're getting at here is that if you're doing a horror genre, right, or some kind of thriller thing, the idea there is to watch a ton of movies that are in that genre, as many as you possibly can. So action adventure um, could also encompass, uh, you know, many different categories. It could be like a romantic comedy action adventure. It could also be, um, it could be a horror action adventure, right? <laughs> so at, at any rate, understanding what genre it's in so so you can see what people did that came before you and what to uh what kind of like formulas and tropes that they're using to be able to use that and adapt in your own story that's one way to do it so research i'm big on research that's that's one way you, you do that right is um uh before you're going to do a scene is go and look at every example you can think of of other scenes that you've seen before that are similar to that right so let's say, and this is one thing when I was working on uh, Rebels, we had a, a, um, we had a, like a, a romantic scene. We had a kiss that we had to do with uh, the main characters. And, uh, and this was my boy Calvin, who's a fantastic and skilled story artist. And we went back and forth. In fact, he probably hates me because we went, <laughs> we went so many times back and forth on coming up with ideas, but it was really hard at first to try and make this work right. And then, so one thing that, uh, you know, that both me and Calvin did was look at research and find like really uh, memorable uh, romantic scenes where you have a kiss, right? And and so I remember watching like Amelie, it was one of the, one of my favorite movies. And, and I thought that was a very unique way that they do it, like a romantic kiss in that film, right? Um, there's other ones too that, uh, that we were looking at, but in, in our particular case, hey, you know, I, we eventually solved the problem. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't as easy as we as you first think. And what happens is you want to be unique and different within that genre and that 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 category. So we've also done things, especially working in TV, where there's like quick turnaround. We have an idea, right? Like a like we did plenty of monster type things. Like another one that we did was like a Tremors uh, homage, where there was like a big underground uh, worm monster that was attacking the crew. And so we, the first thing I did was go and watch Tremors, right? So I watched that film. I really like that movie, actually. I think it's really good. And that one is also a monster in the house category um, because you have a monster and you have a house. You're essentially, you're trapped in that area and you can't get out. So that's the, that's, I like the term. So you wouldn't normally think to call it a monster in the house thing, but that I'm just using Blake Schneider's terms with that, right? Um, all right. So, uh, so that's, that's one idea is basically to understand what you're doing and do your research before you get into um, starting out your sequences and any kind of like story ideas that you're doing. Now, certainly if you're going to make like a longer format, either uh, episodic or, or a feature kind of thing, you really got to do your research. And this is where your film knowledge and looking at your film history really comes into play. And I, I also emphasize, emphasize that something I like to actively do uh, and watching all kinds of films from like the classic era all the way on up to till now, like the modern times, because you, um, 
you really need to understand what people have done before. And it's not necessarily copying. And I think you, those influences that you're going to see, they're going to find their way into the stuff that you do. But if you, here's my, my take on that. If you don't know what has come before you uh, in film history or the film world, you're going to get called out on whatever it is you're doing because you haven't seen that. And let's say you, for whatever reason you came up with what you think is an original idea. Then somebody else is going to watch that and say, oh, that looks like that Ridley Scott movie I saw the other day. Or that looks like James Cameron's uh, blah, 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 blah. And then you're going to be like, and if you haven't seen that, or they might pull one that maybe, you know, if you haven't seen like Akira Kurosawa films, you're going to, you know, you might be not familiar with uh, those Japanese films. And then you won't know what they're talking about, right? So you have to be able to defend yourself as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, by understanding what came before you. Now, some people would argue, well, you want to be fresh, you want to bring your own, your own ideas. But really, there's nothing new under the sun. I, I agree with that line of thinking, that everything's been done before. So because it's been done before, you better look at it and then see how you can adapt and twist it so that you can make it new and different, right? Uh, a great example is, of course, Star Wars, right? Now, if you watch that film and you know George Lucas's influences, which I ended up learning a lot about because uh, I was working at that company for many years, uh, there's a ton of Akira Kurosawa influences in that movie. And there are many other film influences in there. And it's, it's all, if you, if you really analyze that film, it is a kind of like a hodgepodge and a collection of different like film, uh, homages and references all put into one movie. And that in and of itself is actually quite original <laughs> is the way he did it. And of course, he did this in the 70s, which not many people were doing it that way. But the whole, the whole like symphonic score that he wanted there with John Williams and, uh, you know, many different what people thought was break, you know, breakthrough back then was actually referenced from other things he had seen when he was a kid. And so I think the real genius there was that he was able to, like I'm suggesting, he knew his film history and he knew how to take that and adapt it to something else. So, and I think all of the great filmmakers uh, are doing that stuff. Now, another really good example of that is uh, Tarantino, right? He is like the poster child for learning your film history, knowing all of your film references, and then making a film that is basically a recycled homage to those movies and doing it in such a way where it's entertaining, unique, and fresh. And, um, and you know, I, I can't you know, I really like his films, so, you know, not everyone is, is, is a favorite of mine, but I, I know, I appreciate the type of thought and effort that goes into those movies, because, you know, you can tell that guy's a real fanboy when it comes to, to watching film, right? <laughs> uh, cool, so uh, let, me, let me get into some of these comments and questions, and a big what's up to everybody on here, for sure. So it's, it's good to see you guys, and make sure you connect, and you're also following each other. And that way you can uh, you can build up your network. This is all what, what it's all about. So Chad has a great question here. So I've heard a lot of people get stuck in one type of genre or style. How would you go about to avoid getting pigeonholed? Now, that's a really good question. So let me elaborate a little bit about that because um, what ends up happening is you get hired for a particular style as a visual artist and as a storyteller. And you, you might be doing that for many years and you got to get typecast into doing those things. So in my personal experience, for example, um, I started out, uh, you know, I started out as an animator, but then I, I got into story. And then when I started doing story, I was doing kind of lighthearted things and I really liked that. But then I got hired to do, um, uh, to work at, in a video game company and do cinematics and that was like very realistic. So there was like action stuff and I got into doing action. Then I got hired by, um, by Lucasfilm to do action, right? And I showed them my action samples and of course, at what was hilarious is that they never, this was back in the Clone Wars days when I kept on asking in the interview, can I see what you guys are working on? Can I see? And of course it was all hush hush and very secret. I didn't find out what we were working on until I got hired. <laughs> so then I was like, is this going to be a comedy? Is this, I mean, they kind of told me it was, you know, similar to what, you know, Gendy Tartakovsky's Clone Wars was going to be. And uh, it was action show and stuff like that. So I, I kind of knew that, but I didn't, I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to appreciate and see it and read until I read the scripts and, and saw what they were doing. And I was like, oh man, I really got to do my action. So then for like many years, I was doing straight up action, a lot of fighting and sword 
you know, lightsaber and sword fighting essentially in Kung Fu and this and that, researching that and also learning from other badass people who were on that show. So, uh, so I got pretty good, I think, at, at resolving uh, physical action. And then after a while, you know, I, you know, I kind of wanted to do something different. So I, I had to do a change. So one thing I had to do was just leave the project and, and take other assignments. And I had enough samples where I could show people that I could possibly do other things, right? Like I had dramatic examples and I had like, um, and even while working on that show, we had the opportunity to do some comedy and do some other things. But after that, I did get into more comedy stuff and I got into more like family oriented pictures, which I actually like because I, I love the interpersonal drama stuff. So one way to do that is to always make sure you have a number of samples ready to show. Um, and if you have to pivot at whatever point, you're able to do so. So I, this is why, again, going back to this like genre conversation, that you have, a, you have always under your belt, like you can always pull out and show like a comedy example, like a scene that you've done that has like a gag or a series of gags and it's whimsical and funny. Also, not only just with the way that the story unfolds, but also your drawing style. So with action stuff, you might be a little more angular, have light and shadow. With comedy, you might have rounder shapes and bouncier squash and, squash and stretch type, you know, cartoony images there, um, just because it's more lighthearted, right? And the reason you want to do that is just so I look at it as job security. Like you want people to be able to hire you at any given point and and not be um, pigeonholed into a certain thing because they look and you say, wow, you've done all this action, but we're doing comedy here. I don't think we can use you. And then, but that's where you have to have your samples ready to go. And if you show, you know, even if that's not your thing, um, at least you want to be able to do that as a storyteller, like physically be able to do that stuff, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, what, what I always like to do personally as a draftsman, as an artist who's like, uh, you know, drawing and has drawing ability, I want to be able to paint and do light and shade and, and line work and tone and like just the whole thing, gamut. I may not be the best at doing all of that, but at least if I have to, I can kind of resolve it, right? <laughs> so the same thing goes with story. You don't just want to be like one a one note kind of guy. You have to have your full range of musical and visual scales, right? <laughs> so th that's one way I would do it. If you guys have any other suggestions uh, for for that, uh, let us know. Maybe if you've had experience with with other genres or, or switching, pivoting from one thing to the other, let us know. I think it kind of naturally happens over the years because you're, you know, pro it's really project based in this kind of industry for the most part that you get hired on something and then, you know, maybe two to three years down the line, the project just, just you know, the natural flow of things, it'll, it'll end and, you know, the movie is done and then you, you might either you stay on or you go on to another project or you might switch companies. You might want to travel and go somewhere else, right? So it's just, it's natural to do that. Even at if you're locked in a company like Pixar, like I know guys who are longtime uh, employees at that place, and there you even get opportunities within a studio to do other stuff. So that's always kind of cool. Um, so there's a question up here. Let me pull this back and, and see what we got on here. All right, cool. We got a portfolio question from from River here. River is anywhere. Do you think making a storyboard portfolio based on my own story can get some more bonus rather than making a storyboard based on a novel or any reference? So yeah, so I guess the basically the question here is should you do your own original samples in your portfolio or use uh, or use pre-existing material like a novel uh, from what you're asking in your portfolio? Um, if possible, you might want to have both, okay? And one way to do that is just have a snippet, like maybe within your portfolio, there's, you know, I kind of reference these as pages so you can flip through them and you have multiple pages of samples. You might want to do that. Is One is your own story, your own original content, your ideas that you came up with, and just keep it short and sweet, maybe a couple pages. If it's an animatic, you might want to do 30 seconds, you know, minute maximum. And then... Uh, and then you might want to do some script work that's stuff that's already been done. Hopefully it's things that you worked on. If you haven't worked on anything, pick a, pick a universal story like, I don't know, uh, Snow White or something or, you know, any kind of Hans Christian Andersen thing like your take on, um, 
you know, probably best not to do anything modern, like even like the Little Mermaid or, you know, Beauty and the Beast and that stuff is like so, so done. It's been done so many times. You might want to pick something a little more obscure, like the Pied Piper or Rumpelstiltskin or something like that. And, and then do your own version of it. Uh, that way you can uh, show your own style and your own approach to storytelling. That's what they're looking for. So I don't. What I don't recommend is you copy things that have already been done. So don't copy any like Toy Story or Pixar or you know Frozen. Don't show samples of that because if you didn't work on the production, there's no reason you should show that stuff. Uh, it, it's actually not a benefit to your portfolio because uh, basically because you, you, the material's already been created and you're you're essentially like riffing off what's already there. I've seen people do like like superhero stuff like Batman and Superman in their portfolios. Eh, it's all right, but unless you really come up with something unique, those those characters have already been really developed. You might want to come up with an idea, and this is where I say, yeah, push. Oh, I, I always prefer to see your own take and your own storytelling um, approach when it comes to your when your your storyboard. So that that is kind of cool. So yeah, really, the answer to your question is if you can, you have a little bit of both. But I actually prefer doing your own stuff on there, right? <laughs> Um, hopefully that that makes sense. Uh, let me know your. I mean, you guys have an experience with this. You have your own comments on that. Let me know because um, that is. Uh, I don't just want to be you know end all be all on these questions. Like this is always up for debate. I'm, there's no one answer to any of these things. So and I'm certainly not the. Uh, you know I've been around the block, but you, you should also reference other people. <laughs> That's why we have a network, okay? <laughs> All right. So my my Tran here is asking, do you prefer using any specific shot for a specific genre? That's a really good question. And I think it's more to me, it's more of a stylistic choice depending on the genre and depending on the and the project. So for example, in a horror movie, if I'm doing horror stuff. I will look at the the horror and thriller kind of directors that I like, and I'll probably, most likely, I will do something where the, the framing is really tight, and we're using long lenses, so it would blur out the background, and you have a short field, a short depth of field, which essentially only your character would be in focus and everything's pushed in the background. So those are really good for like these long, slow takes, and so I would I would change my my shooting style based on the genre and I just pulled out horror or thriller in that particular case because we always seen these are you know some you've seen movies where you kind of the camera just comes around the edge and you're just barely framing the guy and you know they might be a you don't know if they're about to get jumped or not right it's that mystery and you know the music is playing with violins just so eerily in the background that kind of stuff really really helps and the visuals really help there and that's where you would adapt your style for a specific genre the other things would be if um I mentioned too, uh, hopefully you guys have heard me say this, is that there's different ways of composing your images. You have deep space and you have flat space, right? Uh, that's just, just to give you some like general ideas. There's this, it gets more in depth to that. But a deep space, deep space would be what I, what I prefer to look for because I think the default of flatness is what everybody's natural default would be. Um, it's, it's used to your advantage if you know what you're doing. but um, Everybody seems to default to flatness and just, you know, basic flat background and there's no depth in the angles and the, the cameras look really boring. So what I prefer is depth and you have deep space. And so by doing that, it would draw your audience in. You're creating this illusion of space and, and you really create a, a world for people to come into. And you do that with your camera lenses and your shots. Um, you know, that would be probably for something dramatic, probably something action based. Uh, especially if I want to give that that really like world-like feeling where somebody's coming into this big like Grand Central Station, you know, train station or something like that. Um, the other thing that I would do is uh, the opposite of that, and just doing flat space. If I'm doing something a little more character-based and maybe maybe comedic, where you're you have to do like slapstick or you're telling a joke or or something like that, you might want to lessen the depth in your shots and have like a background like I have now, which is the bookshelf, it's flat. You kind of just, you know, well, there's a lot of distracting things behind me, but <laughs> at least, you know, there's no, there's no people walking around behind me, right? That, that kind of stuff, just you limit 
the background and so that will focus the audience on the character so that those are different ways of uh, just using your shot style for the specific genre again do your research and then look at the directors that you like in any one of these particular genres and uh, pick out the ones that you think are really effective right um, so I, I hope I'm not confusing you with this whole idea of uh, because there's lens choice right there's genre and then there's shooting style which are all different things but they're all very related okay so lens choices would be again I'm breaking this down very simply it's, it's more complicated than this but your wide angle lens versus your long lens right so wide angle of course just like it sounds really wide it's big you see everything you see the whole background a narrow focus, the long lens like you see on uh, sports, you know, broadcasts and stuff like that. Uh, paparazzi photos where they're like way across the street and they only just capture the, the person and everything else is blurry. Uh, that would be a long telephoto lens and you use those for specific reasons. Then your shooting style would be a combination of any of those things with using lenses, using depth and using... Um, uh, you know, the, the types of shots to enhance the material, right? Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that makes sense a little bit. Okay, so we've got another question here from Animation Diva. Uh, as this, is a, this is a great, uh, actually, comment. I once got a job uh, based on my love of sci-fi, and the director hired me for a Transformer spot. Go figure. Draw your own stuff always. Thanks for, for backing us up. I love that comment. That's awesome. Congratulations on that gig. Um, yeah, you know, you hire people for what they bring to the project, right? I, I don't, I personally love to work with people who are thinking, and I mentioned this before, who have their brains on, who can solve visual problems. I don't, I want to know what styles they have. I want to know what kind of abilities and shooting styles that they have when they come on the project, because I don't want them to be robots. I'm not looking for them to copy and just clean up my work. There's just there's too much work to go around. Like, you know, it's very very hard to uh, for one person to do a whole movie. I know, like in Japan, the directors sometimes do that. I wonder how long they actually get to board out the whole film. But man, that's a tremendous amount of work. And actually, I, I'm you know, yeah, I guess the director gets what they want if they do that. But I, I almost wonder the collaboration process to me is so fulfilling and rich, and that people with different ideas really bring a lot to the table. So that is. Um, that's really good for me at least to have different approaches on a project and you know my way of doing it may not be the best idea and I it just because you know I might have thought it through I might have thought it was good but then when I actually do it uh, somebody else might come up with with a better idea and I look at it and say wow that's actually really good and you know let's go with that <laughs> so it's kind of that collaboration process is really important and you know, you might also get inspired by somebody else's idea and then you're able to execute it. I think, you know, I'm actually, I consider myself somebody who's good at execution and, you know, sometimes conceptualizing the idea is where I get stuck. And so that's where uh, you need support and help from other people to, to um, you know, to, to, to get through <laughs> the project and actually get it done, okay? Um, I must say a couple of things just to kind of wrap up on this whole genre discussion. Uh, I, I can't emphasize enough to watch your movies and watch your film history and, and get as much knowledge locked into your brain, into your, into your memory. Now, how to do this, I think some people were asking about that, is how do you fit in your schedule watching all these films and, and doing that stuff. The way that I do it is obviously I set my work hours kind of on my downtime where I can just like like veg out and, and just relax a little bit. I'll turn on Netflix or I'll turn on a movie. Uh, only when I'm working where I have to actually research something, I will use that time where my, and I'm really actually awake and I'm researching stuff. So that's when I'm, I'll watch a movie in the middle of the day because I need to actually pay attention and copy some of those references stuff. So it kind of goes both ways. So I will take, you know, an hour or two out of my day to watch a film or watch some kind of, you know, project, just because I, I need to know uh, what to do or get inspired for something, 
right? That's one way to do it. The other way is what I'm suggesting here is that you set you set a time that like after work or whatever, maybe have an hour after dinner, you know, hour or two to veg out and relax and uh, and work, you know, just kind of watch some some material. Uh, the other thing I would recommend because what ends up happening if you're anything like me, you chock full your your schedule is chock full of activities and things to do. And then even after dinner or whatever, you might have to go back and do some work <laughs> or, you know, and so th there's no time you, you don't, you haven't planned your time to be able to watch, you know, material and stuff. So I've gone actually months <laughs> when I'm really locked down and, and just crunching and not watch new material. Like there was times where like, I think I didn't go to the movies for, for over a year. Now I was actually working in a studio that would show us movies so I did watch those, which was great. So I felt like I got my fill, but I didn't actually go to a movie theater for many months. Um, at, at any rate, what I do now is I lock in my schedule and say like every Thursday or, you know, it's kind of random sometimes, but like at least once or twice a week, at, in, usually for me it's in the evenings, I'll sit down and veg out and watch something on Netflix, even if it sucks. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, you get some good stuff, you get some bad stuff, but it's just nice to keep that film reference things going and uh, and sometimes I have to be in the mood like I, sometimes I don't want to watch black and white films and like these old school things uh, just because I'm not in the mood other times I do I get really inspired by it um, the other day you know this was maybe a year or two ago I saw the movie the train with uh, with Burt Lancaster man you guys should see that film it was really awesome talk about great camera work and actually the story is really solid and I think that was shot in like the late 1940s or early 50s man that film is amazing I saw that um, I caught a bit on TV and then I then I, I watched it on Amazon after uh, after I saw it because I hadn't seen that film before that's one of those things that like I remembered it's like whoa that's a really really good film there's a lot of great camera work and depth in there so um, so cool well let me get to these last two questions and then we'll we'll call it a night but thank you guys for hanging out um, Joseph here is asking, uh, was there a time when you uh, when you do a board, you were restricted by technical limitations or budget? Yeah, there was. <laughs> and I I remember working in video games and doing cinematics for video games. There were certain shots that we couldn't get because of the game engine or the technology at the time. And uh, I would ask if we could do certain things and. It was just too complicated. So, like big, heavy, steady cam moves, um, you know, moving camera shots, sometimes tracking shots with a lot of crowds and things like that were really difficult to render out. So, I had to uh, limit my filmmaking style for that. And actually, when I went to Lucasfilm, um, well, based on that, af afterwards, I, I, I would ask on different projects are there budget constraints and limitations that I need to know about? And uh, one refreshing thing I remember this when I went into work on Clone Wars, and this goes with that, that question uh, or that comment I made earlier about not knowing what the project was about. I asked him, so are there limitations with our shooting style? Like, what is it? Uh, you know, there, I did find the limitations. There were shot length limitations. Like, they didn't, they didn't want us uh, doing really long takes. So I think 10 seconds was the limit. It was really long to do a 10 second shot. And I think I pushed that limit a couple of times. <laughs> I, and I remember, I think I only got one or twice, one, once or twice where they let me have a really, really long shot. Um, they ended up cutting a couple of those, but at least, at least we, we went for it and we tried it. So that's one example. And so I would recommend you guys, anytime you're working on a project, ask them what limitations they have, either budgetary or stylistic limitations for their shots. Um, Sometimes it's refreshing to get to get the answer like no, there's no there's no necessarial necessarial uh, necessarily any limitations to let's say for the budget and stuff they just want to see the ideas and then when they get down to it they might say oh no wow this is a big steady cam crane move I don't think we're gonna do this so let's chop it up into three other shots or something like that so cool great questions um, and let me get this one from Elisa. Uh, Oh, sorry. Um, this is Little Sea Salt Art. Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've been drawing a lot of practice storyboards and was wondering, how do you tell you're getting better? <laughs> how important is it finding good feedback 
And is it hard to find people who know storyboarding? Well, damn it, I think it's hard finding people who know storyboarding because uh, uh, on all the projects I've been on and every time we, we try and hire people, it's really difficult to find qualified, trained candidates who both know the technical facility of doing visual storytelling and are also good storytellers who have the storytelling chops, experience, you know, story structure knowledge that you need to do these things. So yeah, it, it is really hard. Um, that's why we're doing these chats so that we can all get better and you guys are all going to be badasses when you go out there and you start working on these things. And uh, if you have any doubts, well, here's my shameless plug. Come to our our uh, storyboard art platform and start clicking around and looking at some of the resources we have there because that's going to push you in the right direction for sure. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the first part of your question is, how do you know if you're getting any better? That's such an awesome question. And um, so, and then I'll, I will say how important it is to get to find good beef food good feedback, uh, you need, that is so crucial because you're, you're essentially in the dark doing things on your own by yourself without anybody to guide you. This is where I can't stress enough. You need a mentor. You need somebody to guide you. You need a, like somebody who's been down that path before you. And hopefully it's somebody who's pro who's done these things before and can tell you the pitfalls and show you why your decisions uh, you might want to think about other decisions, or maybe your decisions were not completely thought out. Uh, maybe some visual tips to do that, right? Now, uh, so yes, it's super important to have somebody to guide you, to have your back, have a mentor, somebody train you. I've had that, the luxury of having that in my career. If you work in a studio system, you're working with other really cool people and really inspiring, great artists that can help push you uh, in that direction. You can just simply ask. And some people are more forthcoming about you know, showing you how to do things than others just because of the personality. But um, that's why I, you know, that's why we do these things. I really like giving back because so many people were, were, gave to me <laughs> and uh, I'm thankful for that. So, uh, so anyway, I did want to ask, answer the first part of your question because I think it's super important and it, uh, is how do you know if you're getting any better? Here's my take on that. I have a theory is that uh, art is a mental discipline. And you have to do this constantly. That's why I recommend you draw over and over and over again. You practice and you do, uh, you do your studies and you draw like a madman. You keep on working at that. And you do it every single day if possible, um, as much as you possibly can. Because, because of it's, it's a mental discipline. It's something you have to train your hand and eye coordination. You have to be thinking at the same time. There's many, many moving gears that you have to be conscious of as you're doing it. And eventually many, many years down the line, it becomes easier. You start feeling the confidence. It gets second nature. That thinking process uh, becomes faster, and it's just like riding a bike. You don't, you know, after you learn how to do it, you don't remember, you know, how hard to push on the pedal or, you know, where to lean in your balance. You just, you normally naturally do it, right? The way you can see if you're getting any better, and this is, so this is what my theory is all about, is that uh, you don't see the improvement day to day. I don't see my improvement day to day. I see it over many months and many years. And I don't know why that is. And I have a theory about this, but it's not like if you go to the gym and you start, you know, running on the treadmill every day, you will notice that you, your lung capacity actually physically gets better. Like you improve, like you're able to run longer, run faster, whatever. And you physically know, note the difference from one week to the next and maybe one month to the next after doing, let's say, a certain amount of exercises. Same thing with music. If you play the piano uh, and you start on day one and you go through it a month later, you're going to notice that your fingers are more coordinated. You remember the, the, the music and the scales and all that stuff. You, you feel like you're getting better. You can hear it. In fact, you can record yourself and you can see if you're getting any better. With art, for some reason, it may be because it's the way that we execute our drawing. There's so many variations. With, when it comes to line quality and tone and storytelling and you know things coming in and out of the shots, there are so many variations to keep track of uh, that for me it's difficult to see the improvement on a daily or weekly basis, even on a monthly basis sometimes it's difficult. So my recommendation here is you, you don't stop. You will get better, all right? Trust me, I guarantee this. What This is like, like those infomercials that you saw back in the day or you guarantee, you money back guarantee that if you don't, if, if you don't stop, you keep on doing this, you will improve. Trust me, you will improve. But it takes 
lots of time. So you have to enjoy the process in order to improve. And you have to really enjoy the journey. And that struggle has to be fun. And if you do that, the way you're going to see the improvement is from year to year. And probably, so I, I recommend doing a three month, six month and year check-in with, um, you know, like quarterly check-ins, let's say. And it's almost like maybe you should just do it six month span check-ins. If you done so save all your work or save as much as you can and go back and look at the stuff that you've done like six months prior and then see if you if you've improved at all right and be honest with yourself maybe say man i'm still just as bad <laughs> my, my, my line work is still just as crappy if that's the case that's where alarm bell should go off in your head and you start asking other people like what do i need to do to improve right so imagine going to the gym for six months and you're just as flabby and fat as you were when you started, you, you know, that's not going to be fun. You're going to hate it. So this is where you have to do it. But again, here's my guarantee. If you do it six months later, I almost, I have to guarantee this, man. I'm telling you, you're going to get better. You're going to see improvement. If you save your work from a year and you go back and you look on your stuff, you're going to say, wow, this is, I see my line quality is better. I'm more confident in doing this. I no longer flounder when I'm doing a certain amount of shading. That kind of stuff really, it's, that's where you see it, okay? And then years go by and you look at your work, you're like, man, I was terrible back then. I'm way better now. You like give yourself a boost. I've done this. So I look at my sketchbooks. I've done both, right? I look at my sketchbooks. I go, wow, man, I was terrible back then. <laughs> and uh, that's fine. You know, we all got to start somewhere. And then the other one, I look back at some sketch and I'm like, hey, you know, that's not so bad. That, that, hey, all right. Like I, I, I feel like somewhat proud of what, <laughs> what I've done because, because uh, I like the sketch, or you know. I, and then, and then you post it to Instagram and you see if somebody else likes it too, right? <laughs> so anyway, stick with it, my friends. That's the that's the bottom line here, and you will get, you will see improvement. Trust me. And if you need a good kick in the ass, well, come to us. We're here to give you the boot where you need it and uh, push you in the right direction because this, you know, this is fun. This is supposed to be fun. So if, if you if you're struggling, you're not gonna have fun. And so I want you guys to enjoy this stuff. I want you to be strong filmmakers. I want everybody to always be thinking about cool stories and create coming up with creative ideas and being able to have the technical capacity to do so. And because of that, um, yeah, because of that, we want you. We want you. Uh, to come and learn from us. All right, all right, friends. Um, keep up the good work and we will see you next time. This is a good place to end it. Have a great evening and we'll talk to you soon. All right, see ya.